Uh, welcome to the Sports Science Dudes. I am your host, Dr. Jose Antonio, with my co-host, Dr. Tony Ricci. Also joining us is fellow PhD and Paddler, Victoria Burgess. Um, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, Rumble, and YouTube. Our special guest today, uh, we get athletes on occasion, usually fighters, but I'm happy that we have uh, someone who paddles because <laughs> Victoria and I talk about paddling all the time and we're in South Florida, so everyone has to paddle. But our special guest is Danny Ching. He's a professional stand-up paddleboarder, also does outrigger canoe, OC1, OC6. He lives in Rod Redondo Beach, Florida. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, Florida, California. Is that, where, where is that relative to Los Angeles? I'm not sure. It's like 20 minutes from LAX on the beach. Los Angeles is 20 minutes away. Ah, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, right where you land. When you come in on the plane, everything to your right. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Now, he uh, he also, he co-founded two major brands, the 404, if you love paddle boards. Also, the Hippo Stick, which is my favorite paddling, uh, my, my favorite paddle. Um, he's also the father of two girls. In fact, I like the videos where you're teaching them paddling. <laughs> I can't imagine, you know, having little kids out there, but they feel very comfortable with you. So that's super cool. Um, also, I didn't know you were actually a Dragon Boat World Champion in addition to OC1 and stand-up paddling. Because Dragon yeah, Boat's a buddy of mine kind sport. of pulled me into that one. Oh, really? Dragon Boat's pretty big. It's uh, <laughs> 20 people in a boat all trying to work together. And uh, the nice thing is it's very similar to the Outrigger, which I grew up with. So that was an easy transition for me. Yeah, it's funny. You watch some of the, and Victoria, I'm sure you've seen some of the dragon boaters down here. Sometimes when I watch them, I feel like I'm watching caterpillars. It's, if you're not in sync, it's just a bunch of paddles going, oh, <laughs> crazy still. Um, so Danny's also, he's also known for his involvement in promoting the sport through clinics, workshops, and demonstrations. Um, you can find him on Instagram at dannyching404. So Danny, welcome to the show. Um, this will be a fun show, certainly laid back. Um, I'm sure the paddling lifestyle sort of by definition is laid back. So <laughs> as I'd mentioned early, Tony and I do a lot of research and exercise in sports science. Uh, Victoria got her PhD, actually. I was one of her mentors for uh, in exercise and sports science. So I want to focus a little bit on uh, first on training, because I think we could all relate to that. And my first question to you, uh, let me preface it first by uh, at the university, when I talk to collegiate swimmers, I'm always astounded at how much volume swimmers do. They're literally in the water anywhere from 20, maybe as high as 27 hours a week. Now, runners can't do that because running beats the hell out of your body. And people say, well, why can paddlers do that? Because they're not really beating the hell out of their body the way a runner does. So I wanted, you know, your old class, I wanted your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, like you said, the swimming, I, I actually did collegiate swimming as well. And the, the amount of hours you have to put in the water is pretty insane. As far as the paddling goes, it's it's kind of halfway between swimming and running. You can put a lot of wear and tear on your body, depending on what type of craft you're paddling. But you can also do it so comfortable and easy that if you wanted to go put down a workload like that, as long as you kept it in a rhythm, it would be fine. But uh, like like you said, uh, I've done stand-up paddling, and you're standing up on a board. The boards aren't inherently as fast as some of the boats we sit down and paddle. You're by yourself. The lever's very long. So if you make mistakes or if you go hard, everything's magnified. And so what I found is the stand-up paddling is the most punishing version of paddling that I'll do. Um, just because you're trying to accelerate something that's heavy, that doesn't want to glide, that you have to keep turning over. And every time you hit the water, you get a little impact, not like running, not like weightlifting, not like fighting, but you're still a little bit of impact. And it is a repetitive impact to a lot of joints, a lot of body parts. So when I'm doing the stand up paddling is I actually have to scale way back on what I would consider high mileage. So I grew up paddling outrigger canoes, which are the Hawaiian canoes with the little almas on the side, the outriggers. They're a lot smoother. You're sitting down. You have a little better leverage point. Um, it's just a lot more forgiving on the body. So when I do kind of my outrigger mileage, is I'll keep it in the 10-ish hours a week. And if I put it into stand-up, I kind of have to scale back and really focus on when to put in rest. Because if you break a body part, it takes a long time to come back from that. When you say outrigger, you're talking about OC1? Yes, OC1 and even the OC6 canoes. So 10 so, hours ten hours a yeah. week. Yeah. And if you look at it like a swimmer, I mean, 
my my personal experience is if you are swimming butterfly every day, you're going to do less mileage than if you're swimming freestyle. Um, something similar to that is just the amount of load you're putting on your body, standing up versus a single person craft that's really, really light. And then sometimes we'll jump into the team boats. I know Victoria just got a, a six man boat and starting team. And it could be much, much easier because the team's right in line and everyone's in sync or it could be a lot harder because they're not in sync and now you get all the way to the boat and all the way to your friends <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's funny victoria and, and danny you know that happens if you're in an oc and you're in seat one or two a lot of times you know it's like is anyone paddling behind me <laughs> it's like and then you, you feel it, you're like, oh, there we go <laughs> <laughs> really okay. then all of a sudden it goes so um so if you're let's say how about this if you're training for a stand-up race danny um, is a lot of that still OC training just to take some of the wear and tear off your body? Or are you focusing in terms of hours per week on stand-up? So for me personally, I do multiple seasons at the same time. So I always have OC involved. Um, but just like you said, if I get into a section of the season where it's mostly stand-up, the stand-up stuff I use as more fine-tuning my skills. I've done enough years of paddling to where I don't need to go put 20 hours a week in that motion. But if I do too many hours on a stand up, I can hurt myself. If I don't do enough, I don't get that feeling and that rhythm that that craft is, is needs to kind of go fast and, and the skills you got to practice, like going in and out through waves, making a turn. If you don't go through those motions and you only paddle something else, when you switch over, it's, it's a lot more difficult, even if you've done it before. So is there so, a minimum number of hours on stand up you would do? In uh, yeah. So in preparation for a big race, minimum number of hours I would put on the stand up would be about four. And of that, maybe two of them would be hard just because putting out a hard hour workout is it's a big ask. I equate that more to like a CrossFit workout where you're going to need a little more warm up, a little more time to recover afterwards, maybe a day of rest. But a lot of times I'm just putting down an hour, hour and a half of easy paddling skills, just sort of cruising. But then again, if you're a racer, sometimes you get sucked into today's an easy day and you're going as hard as you can with your friends. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah, I find that a lot too. Like when, even when you're going out for an easy paddle, like I did today, I caught myself, I was easy paddle technique, caught myself a few times, like do do do. And then all of a sudden I was going like way too hard, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, Sh just slow down for a second. Hold on. <laughs> so, so yeah, you got to watch it. Can I just ask for those of us who don't know the sport well, Danny Vic? When you, um, I, I'm assuming just bioenergetically wear and tear, the stand up is more demanding. Um, but is, is there a specificity like in region that takes the greatest amount of punishment? Is this hardest on shoulder? Is it hardest on lower back? Or, I mean, is it just global wear and tear that makes it so challenging? So what ends up happening in the paddling stroke is you're going to reach out with your arms and you're going to lean towards your paddle and the paddle's supposed to grab the water and stop and you're supposed to move past it. Um, if you're using a longer liver, every time that paddle touches your hands, touches your elbows, touches your shoulder, those are all turns and joints it's got to go through. So if you're not lined up correctly and you have a really long lever attached to something that doesn't want to move very fast, it's very easy to tweak an elbow, right. tweak a shoulder. Mm -hmm. And then the worst part is when you blow out a knee because you look backwards at your friend and all of a sudden the board moved out of your way and you're running off the back. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. I just call it it's when it's more fun, it's the most fun. When it's more painful, it's the most painful. That's that's the more version of paddling. Okay. Yeah, this this is this might be more of an esoteric question, but do you do you use different length paddles for stand-up depending on I mean an, an inch on a paddle makes a huge difference. And this is me no, not knowing anything about the sport when I first started. I had a 76 and a 77 inch uh paddle. And I found Whenever I had shoulder issues, I would just use the shorter paddle. That, it's one inch shorter. Whenever I had back issues, I would just use the longer paddle. And for whatever reason, it works because it changes the lever arm. Now, I don't know if anyone else does it, but that's what I've done. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm just crazy. I'm like, hey, you know, my back hurts. I'm going to use yeah, I better the longer paddle. I mean, what the hell's going on? So what do you think, Danny? Well, you you nailed it. And a lot of what we learn in, in stand-up is we're drawing from other sports. We're drawing from other things we've done in the past, and we're trying to apply it to what we know now. But like you said, if you change the length of the lever, for most of us, we tend to reach out and put the paddle down in the same spot, no matter what anybody tells us. Yeah. And if that paddle is longer, it's going to stop sooner, and you're going to be taller. 
So you're saving your back. If that paddle's shorter, you're going to fall down sooner and you're going to be shorter. And if your top hand is in a very exposed position and you decide you wanted to go hard, the shoulder doesn't always hold. And so making those tiny little adjustments is kind of important. And what we found is it's kind of that cadence and that speed you want to travel. There's a, you know, essentially you have your tall paddle fifth gear and then you have your short paddle first second gear. And I've actually started racing in the last few years with a paddle that will adjust four to six inches. Hmm. Wow. Wait. So, especially when the race is like two wait, hours. Wait, yeah. how long? How long is your paddle? Uh, so I'll start. I have a paddle that goes from a 68 to a, almost a 74. How tall are you? I am 5'9". Wow. So that's that's much shorter than I've used. Uh, I guess Victoria is always saying, hey, maybe you should bend your torso more or something. <laughs> yeah. Maybe your paddle's well, you always... too long. <laughs> maybe your paddle's too long. You need another hip got... Yeah. <laughs> so the paddles are, are, in theory, they're faster when they're longer. The problem is if your body starts ripping apart while you're trying to do it, it then you're not faster anymore. So there's that constant trade-off. And with the way we, we participate in races now, it's sometimes there's waves, sometimes you're going upwind. And then with the longer races, people will just kind of pull into your draft, which is not breaking the wind or the water. They actually are surfing the wake that you're putting off. So they're working sometimes <laughs> as little as half the effort. And so in order to, to get rid of somebody, even though I can be faster than them with the longer paddle, I'm never going to change speed where they're going to fall off. They're just going to keep surfing. And at the very end, they have a tiny little paddle and they're going to spin right by you. So mm -hmm. I make the adjustment on the paddle now and I just bring While you're real paddling? adjustable. Yeah. So I take oh, our dragon cool. T-top that doesn't twist. So I can just pop it and throw it up and then mm -hmm. I can pop it and throw it down. That's awesome. And so it takes one second. And if I'm cruising along, I can make the paddle nice and long. I can rest mm -hmm. my back. I can sit up and no one's going anywhere. And if anyone decides they want to try and like, oh yeah, I got a short paddle. Watch me <laughs> go. I have time to shorten it and chase them down. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, that's I like cool. that. And it's great for all condition races, like, you know, ocean, flat water kind of style. So. Yeah. And you'll show up to a race and you think it's going to be flat. And you'll look outside and it's huge. You're like, well, I don't think I brought the right equipment. Yeah. <laughs> that's Victoria's so nice race to be able to be every like, year. All of these. Every time. Just assume it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just buy a van and bring it all. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, how much do you think the uh, the weight of a board matters in terms of speed because i it seems like people are trying they're just trying to narrow the board which basically takes material off it but then the rails have to be higher but ultimately it seems like making a board lighter seems to be what board manufacturers are trying to do so that you're faster what are your thoughts so for the majority of what stand-up has been, they just take like a surfboard design and then they have some rocker on it and they have a roundish or a slight concave bottom. And then, like you said, they made the board narrower and then it would sink and it would actually get slower and water would go over the side. So they'd raise the gunnels, like raise the rails to be taller. And so every time they go narrower, they got to go a little bit higher and higher and higher. And so we used to ride six inch thick boards maybe. Oh, but they were super wide at like 28, 30 inches wide. And now that they're in that 19, 20 range, some of the boards are as thick as 12 inches. And so with the foam and the capacity, they, they've come up with this volume measurement. Like what is the volume you need if, for whatever weight you are? And what we're finding is that it's kind of like saying, hey, you're a person. I don't know if you're man or woman or how tall you are, but how much do you weigh? And I'll make an assumption on whether or not you're right for me. Hmm. And so the volume measurement, if it's underwater, makes a lot of sense because that's how quickly you're going to come back up. But if it's above water, then it's really just added weight. And it just kind of, we, we kind of explain it in terms of like, you need the board to be taller if it's going to be rough because you don't want water coming over the top that actually slows you down. And if it's not coming over the top and you're carrying 10 inches of board, then it's extra weight. And like you said, we're trying to shed some weight out of the board because a lighter board is going to initially pick up speed quicker. Problem with that is once you're up to speed, a lighter board is also going to slow down quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so some of our older boards, I'm sure Victoria has a few boards where it's like, hey, this is old, this is waterlogged, this is a you know not very good board, but it's still fast. Yeah, when you get it going. <laughs> yeah, the hardest part is getting it into your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I got I got a couple of boards like that. A little extra weight, a little extra carry, and 
as long as you can get the board running, I call them downwind boards because the yeah. ocean is moving with you. The waves are moving with you. So the weight is not as big of a deal. Um, but if I was going upwind, then it, you, you feel it. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this. Um, some of these boards, uh, they have, and I've always pondered this. I'm not a biomechanist, but I've thought about the surface area that's actually touching the water. So let's say you have a 24 inch board but there's a channel down the middle. And I think the RS boards have that. What they've basically done is increase the surface area, which would increase, I would think, I, Tony, what do you think? It would increase the drag because there's more surface area. So even though they've narrowed the board, <laughs> there's that tunnel. I, I don't mm -hmm. know if it's a tunnel. It's that groove in the middle. And I see this with a lot of boards. It's like, hey, you've narrowed it, but you're, there's still all the surface area that you're creating. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Tony, you're probably thinking I have you have no idea what the hell I'm trying to describe. Uh, no, I'm just thinking in terms of a single hull versus catamaran boat, but I don't think that analogy would apply very well. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. Single hull versus catamaran. And they actually have a rule that you cannot make a catamaran because it's cheating, because it'd be inherently more stable and less drag. Okay. But the rule is no catamarans. You can have concaves and stuff like that. And so like I've, I've started designing the boards in the last recent years. And one of the big things we found is by adding that concave, depending on where you add it, either creates more stability for the rider during the stroke or in between strokes. And the other one is um, when the boards are round and you take a stroke, they all inherently want to lift up the nose. Mm -hmm. And then that nice, round, efficient surface that you're supposed to cut through the water is actually pushing during mm -hmm. the part of the stroke where everyone's doing their power. And so when I look at the boards, I'm always trying to fight between I need less resistance during the power so that when we're taking our stroke, we don't get beat up as bad. And then I need it to actually sit down and carry some of that glide. And realistically, after coming off of canoes and even the Olympic kayak scene and the dragon boats and the OC1s and OC6s, the boats and the boards are not glide very far. And so yeah. we're not really winning these marginal percentages of my board has less or more glide than yours because there's not a lot of time between strokes. Mm -hmm. And if you're taking a lot of time between strokes, you're getting beat by anybody that's taking another stroke. Whether or not it's a good one doesn't even matter. You're just constantly adding propulsion. Then you're beating anyone who's taking a break and going, my board glides. My board glides. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, so the design feature is that singular propulsion. I don't want it to hurt too bad, but then I need the board to reset before I can get to that next stroke so it wants to go. And nine times out of 10, if you're making a very narrow board, if I can make it more stable, you're going to be much happier and you're going to think it's faster. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have and actually- a... What you think is it, it is propelled into what you're doing. You know, If you think it's faster, sometimes you actually just go faster. Because you're not so, you you're not faster, thinking about it not being unstable. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and that, that I'm actually worried about swimming in manatees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The the idea of uh because you bring the idea of a uh, stroke rate or cadence. Um I actually found the study on this. I didn't know this existed. Victoria, you'll be interested. This was published actually in 2020. And Danny, I want your thoughts on it because they tested uh they said they tested 10 male paddlers who are who are highly trained. Uh, they were international sub competitors, so I don't know who they are. Maybe you were in this study. And nope. I'll just read you the conclusion. Uh, international male sub paddlers were most efficient and economical when paddling at 45 versus 55 or 65 strokes per minute. So 45, which is slower, um, which seems counter to what you just said. Uh, and this was confirmed by lower RPE, a rating of preserved, rating of preserved ex exertion values, which which may likely translate to faster paddling speed and greater endurance. Now, I would imagine this is quite individual. Tony doesn't like. look convinced. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem right, but go on. I'm not the expert here. Yeah, the, the 45 versus 55, like I, I don't think, even think I could keep a 65 uh, stroke per minute cadence if I wanted to. So when you hold your clinics, I'm sure people ask this, they're like, well, how, how many strokes per minute should I do? What's the answer? Oh, uh, doesn't matter because this, when I give a number for that, we're not measuring it and it's constantly changing with the water. Mm -hmm. So that's like saying, you know, in running, we can say it's perfectly flat. There's a time distance. As a human, we are physically capable of doing this. So now I need you to be at this cadence and I need you to stride this far. In the water, that 
that's 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 ideal but you cannot you cannot paddle that way you cannot swim that way you cannot catch a wave that way and so the idea is at a lower cadence your perceived effort is much easier because you are going slower and slow is easy <laughs> if you try and take that same stroke and that same cadence and do it faster it becomes exponentially harder and yeah. the way i always explain this in my clinics is there is a way to walk and there are speeds you should walk at and if you go outside those speeds above or below it doesn't make sense and it becomes a very inefficient way to travel when you hit a certain speed and if you want me to give you a number i could make one up for you but we all know there's a point when you're walking faster and faster and faster and you should start jogging because it's more efficient mm -hmm. and then we're going even faster and there's a point where you are running and you should not be jogging and you should not be walking. You should be running. And what happens is you change those, that style of paddling and how you do your technique to move based off of the cadence. Because if you take a long, slow 45 stroke cadence and you just try and do everything the same faster, you are not a machine. The body just can't hold on. It can't keep up with itself. So you start hurting your shoulders. Your paddle's too long or too short. Now your back hurts. So you have to make adjustments. I'm sure, Tony, you're a fighter. There's a big difference between a setup jab and an overhand right and an uppercut, and you can't really Actually, do them all the same. And yeah. there's a time and a place for it. You don't know when. It just happens. <laughs> and, to your, and to your point, that the environment's too dynamic to standardize the volume yeah. of punches or, you know, you got to move with that, like you said, out there, Danny. So, yeah. So the, so the, the environment and the weather conditions, the water conditions – are going to be a big determining factor on that stroke rate for, in many cases. And whether or not you're trying to get more speed and momentum, or if you're just trying to hold on to what you yeah. got, or if you're even willing to, hey, I'm letting it come down, but as long as I can get a breath, I can go up again later. So we're constantly making those adjustments. And if you've ever had to swim a long distance, not for a race, not for anything, just like swimming in the ocean, sometimes you're dying, sometimes you're catching a wave, and sometimes right. you're cruising along. And it is all one stroke to the next changes and you just kind of adjust to it. So the study, if you're doing everything exactly the same, the same way is right. But at 45 strokes a minute, I am, I'm going slow. I'm not trying to accelerate at 45 strokes a minute. If I did having to push and accelerate at 45 is just too heavy of a load. If I wanted to bring up the cadence, I would bring down the weight. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is if you can somehow keep the movement in the board and bring up your cadence, even though your stroke doesn't go as far and isn't as powerful, if you can just keep taking it over, it's just like, you know, turning down the resistance on your Peloton and getting a little more output. Mm -hmm. Would that be, would that be an argument for having a much smaller surface for your paddle? Because, well, that's why the paddles are so small now. They used to be way oh, bigger. Compared, yeah. Way bigger. I found one of my old <laughs> last week and I was like, oh, no wonder why we had such issues. <laughs> Bad shoulders. Yeah. 89 wow. inch tall paddle. <laughs> They're just outrigger paddles slapped into old Sersky paddles. Yeah. <laughs> so, were they wooden? Were they heavy wooden paddles? Some were wood. Some were definitely wood, but they're mostly, <laughs> mostly carbon. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I've since uh, adjusted how I teach because most people want to bend over and pull when they explain. But if you've ever bent over and put yourself in that position and then tried to pull something heavy, it's very counterintuitive. So when we talk about paddling, a lot of times we're done and we're trying to remember to that feeling we had when everything was going really well and we're going really fast and super awesome. And then all we can really remember is usually what we see with our eyes, which is reach more pull harder at the front and I've actually totally flipped the explanation because you do do the work up front but imagine if you're running and someone told you to reach your foot further out and slam it down harder <laughs> uh, no it's funny Dan. If, you're, I, if you're not running it looks like that <laughs> I remember when my kids my kids are out of college now but when they were in high school and they ran track I remember a father yelling at her daughter saying just run faster <laughs> I'm like obviously <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, she's going to hate running now after dad just yells at her. Just run. Yeah, she could run. Just faster. look over. What do you want to go faster? My hands? My shoulders? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do have a question. This this is what I learned when I, I used I dragon boated for a very short period. But when, when I did OC, uh, there are big sticklers with this. And even a little bit would stand up is when do you pull the paddle out of the water? I'm just curious what your answer is. Uh, so basically you have to load your weight so that it supports you yep. then the board moves 
and then you have to unload it. And that is a balanced feeling. So I always tell people focus on the top, the T top and pushing into the top, not because I actually want them to push power, but because it's a very obvious cue and adults are really good at not wanting to fall on their face. So there's a load into it. And if they go too far, they instantly know and they fix it on the next stroke. Or if they go to put the paddle down and it's in the wrong spot, they know. And I don't have to explain any of the things. But my favorite is, you know, how much pressure do I put on my top hand? I was like, oh, no problem. 37 pounds. <laughs> that help? <laughs> it's kind of a smart ass joke of like, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's enough. If you put enough pressure on the top hand, it makes sense. If you put too much, it hurts really bad. You don't go anywhere. And you're like, yeah, I don't think that was right. <laughs> and, on, and on an OC, do you take the paddle out when it comes to your hips? I usually end up past my hips. So one of the cues we've been using this year to try and get our team on the same page is we have like 80 guys on the water at once. So Ooh. I can say stuff and about three of them are listening. <laughs> so we got to have a couple visual cues and it's not perfect, but it helps <laughs> is I want them pushing into that top hand until the bottom hand touches their hip. Hmm. Tony, that's so like that gives huge. them. <laughs> you talked to yep. 30 of them and like one is listening. I, yeah, I, I, 80. I can't imagine. On the water, uh, too, you said. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of, if you want to hear, come closer. If you don't want to hear, just stay over there. Just and, watch uh, the person in I think front we're going to go this way. <laughs> yeah. Go when uh, someone says go, stop when they say stop. <laughs> I want to switch a little nutrition, unless Victoria or Tony had other questions about training. I mean, I could ask a million and one questions, but, you know, interest of time, I want to do it. Well, I, you know, and this isn't really a question, it's just something that me and Joey or Jose talk about a lot is what do you think about, so you know how volume obviously is king. And in your case, you do a lot of volume because you have a lot of different crafts, right? So yeah. with some people, they don't have, they don't sit down, whatever. What are your thoughts on um, land, land volume, like cardio land-based volume to get in extra volume for cardio uh, when you can't do that much on the water because of the toll it takes on your body? Do you feel like that's beneficial or have you done that modality before? Definitely. Definitely. If, if you have, um, if you can work out your cardio or your strength, if you have a weakness or something that you want to buffer when you're actually doing a paddling style event where either you get winded really easy or you're not strong enough, um, you can add that into your training program. But then I always get the question like, you know, so should I do it like five times a week, six times <laughs> a week? If you want to be better at paddling, you need to paddle. Yep. And then you supplement in, hey, once or twice a week, I can throw this in extra. But if you only paddle like two or three times a week, and then you're like, but I go to the gym six times. Well, <laughs> I hope it's winter in Canada because <laughs> that's not enough to get it done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I always add it in as like, hey, that's that's the extra. That's the cherry. Mm -hmm. But you got to get a base paddling volume in. And I mean, for most people who are super serious, there's a good six times on the water a week we should be looking for yep. um, and spread that out obviously rest is huge and then if you do beat yourself up you can't be like well i'm gonna go rest in the gym right right doesn't help rest is rest, is rest. <laughs> yeah so like um during covid i did a bunch of training programs for people and that was the big thing i said hey let's talk and you know you can't tell me i have every day i can paddle off but that's because i work every night Right. Like we got to work something in there. Oh, I'll just, you know, I'll just stay up all day and all night. Oh, God. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a good so, thing. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a good thing, Victoria, you, you got the OC, so that helps. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a question for me. That was just, <laughs> we always talk about it a lot because in Florida lately, there's been a ton of unbearable wind. Yeah. And it's it true. comes to a point where it's like, you know, am I paddling to like get a workout or am I just going on my board to get hours and on my board and I'm not actually able to paddle because I'm just like, there's side wind everywhere. You can't even hide from it. So, you know, bringing in extra stuff for somehow the canoe is way better in the wind, way better. Hey, way hey, less you painful. can hide a little bit from the wind. Yeah. yeah. It's painful. <laughs> so just, I'll tell just you the, the big thing to watch out for is when you, if you're trying to be better at paddling, if you're trying to train to get better for like an event or something, make sure when you're paddling, you are training something. You are not exercising while paddling, like you said. Mm. That's a yeah. very big difference of, I did my one hour at the correct intensity, not paying attention to how you paddle, right, the right. feeling of the water, any of the skills. Yeah. You're just like, ah, oh, 
I got on the row machine for an hour. It was like, yeah, that's exercise. You're not training to row. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Because paddling is such an like an efficient like an efficiency type of sport. Like the more efficient you are, in this case, you know, the faster you're gonna go like forever. Well, something like running, you know. But yeah, everyone gets focused on how do I train the body to be at peak performance at this exact heart rate that I was told is good. Yeah. And I go, yeah, but can you go fast? Is it easy? Exactly. Is this something you could do? You know, you got to learn the motion. You got to learn the water. You got to learn the equipment. So I always talk about, you know, they say, hey, big volumes at like 70% or like base work. Um, for me, because I don't like staring at my watch the whole time. It messes me up to see if my heart rate's right, to see if the speeds are right. Is I'll put that on my wrist. So I have to like, when I have a good feeling, I can check it and just right. see if I'm kind of in the area and then keep going. And then the other one is like, when we're doing those, because most people don't know what that feeling is, I go, hey, it's that easy flowing speed. It's not the number you want. Sometimes it's way higher because you're going in the wind and it's great. Sometimes it's way lower. Just as long as the board or the craft is releasing every yeah. stroke, go as hard as possible while having that feeling, which is usually about 70%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and if that that's feeling goes away, you ain't going, you're not paddling for very much longer. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no way to fight it in that sport with the water moving. That's for sure. Just gotta gotta water wins. You had a question, I think, Tony. No, it, just quick, because I know you wanted to get into nutrition. And I was wondering for the layman like us who don't know the sport well, like if you had a dry land recommendation, would it be concept two? Would it be a Nordic track? Like if there was a good translation or carryover to dry land cardio as a supplement, is any one type in your eyes probably uh, superior? And is what I was going to just ask quickly. Um, you know, I really like the uh, the cross country erg for that. Okay. That's a really okay. good. Yep. Um, the rowing urge is pretty good too, but a lot of those uh, those cable motions are like, I call them fingertips to toes, where you have to start where you load into your arms and then you go out of the body and push all the way through. Right, right. So if you can practice any of those motions where you're loading and you're not killing yourself, like not like a pull-up, but more like a pull-up with bands where you get a little bit of assistance and you're just working that push through. Right. I actually okay. have a total behind me. Oh, so yeah. we'll use the cable oh, yeah. on that. Okay. And, totally. you know, the wood chops up and down. And then anytime right. you're going to do stuff like that, I always say if you're going to do one, you want to do like the opposite motion just to counter yourself. So you're not breaking yourself the same direction. Very cool. Danny, what's the uh, <laughs> oldest someone has come to you and said they want to learn how to paddle? Mm -hmm. Oldest person? 76. Wow. Yeah. Bless them. That's wow. awesome. That's yeah. and the reason I bring that up is... um. There was actually a study comparing paddling to walking in older individuals. And it basically, which makes sense, they found that paddling <laughs> produces much better balance control <laughs> than walking, which, well, of course, because <laughs> paddling is a lot harder. But it's it's interesting that, you know, we live in South Florida, you know, all of us, ex well, except you, but um, it's, you could literally train outdoors, yet it's not... It's not like a an exercise of choice for a lot of people for whatever reason, even though it's super safe. I mean, you could go on the intercoastal. It's always flat there. Even if it's windy, it's always flat. But um, you don't see many as many people as you would think. And I don't know if it's like that in California. Uh, it's hit and miss. Um, whenever it's sunny and beautiful, it's packed. And then like this last weekend, it was cold and rainy and it was dead. So uh, for us, it's it's more weather dependent. It's always... It's, it's always been weather dependent. And then in the summer, it gets really crowded. A lot of people take out their boards and it's kind of something new where, where I live in Redondo, we have this tiny little harbor. <laughs> Sorry. That's your daughter. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Oh. Um, so our, our harbor is like a half mile long and we'll put, you know, 11 OC6s out. And so ah. we're going around in circles. People see that stand up boards start popping out kayaks start popping out and then it gets cold and rainy and it's just us <laughs> <laughs> hey let's uh let's talk nutrition um like uh victoria when you when you were doing the crossing from cuba to key west obviously in addition to the skill which you already had i mean you have the skill to paddle open water ocean nutrition really was the key and the idea was if you could keep your central nervous system awake you can do it. I mean, you can, your brain can basically convince yourself to do something, you know, basically if your life <laughs> depended on it, which your life kind of depended on, right? <laughs> and I so, so I don't know, Danny, if, if there are nutritional or supplemental things that you do personally or advice you give to people you coach 
Um, I'm curious to hear what, what, what you have done. Yeah, so most of the races I do are usually around an hour long, but some of the bigger ones, um, uh, when we do stand up, like the Carolina Cup is like two, two and a half hours. And that starts pushing into the realm of you've got to prepare your body, you know, ideally leading into it for a week where you're getting hydrated, you're eating right, you're sleeping right. But then when you get to the race, you got to have some basic nutrition. Um, for me, it's you got to have carbs at some point, some some way, however you can get them down, something to keep you rolling. And then I just call it whatever it takes to not cramp. So that's your whatever your version of the Gatorade powder is. I use um, we started using liquid IV. It tastes fine. It works. We used to use EFS and a long time ago before that, we were like Cytomax. There's all sorts of different right. um, hammer gel nutrition, Perpetuum. Um, but the two things we've kind of come to the conclusion is in these longer races, I'm trying to solve problems before we get there. And then problems are inevitably going to happen. And so what is my band-aid for that? So if I start cramping, I have my version of a salt tablet, which is the, um, the hammer gel and Duralites. And for me, I have to do the extremes because my body processes stuff really fast. So if I start cramping at all, I just, hey, bring me bring me a handful and I'll a try and bottle. choke down. <laughs> no, not a whole oh bottle, God. but I need a handful because they're just throwing them at me and I'm just trying to get two in my mouth. Like, you know, you're trying to paddle, you're doing all these things. Yeah, and they're like, hard. here's the pills. Try and choke these down. It's like, oh Jesus, okay. But again, that's the bandit of like, what happened? Like, I didn't drink enough. It got too hot. I went too hard too early. This is going to stop your cramp. And this is going to buy you 15 to 30 minutes of no cramping. And I go, okay, there's an hour left. You're going to have to do this a couple more times. <laughs> yeah. And then the other one is um, these um, amino acid pills. They're just mass, what is it? MAP, M-A-P, mass, yep. master acid pattern or something yeah um a buddy of mine gave them to me when i was training really hard in the gym and he goes these are really good for like you know recovery or pre-workout and he was a cyclist and I, all right let me take a look and i ended up grabbing them on accident during a race because it's a little white pill bottle next to my little white pill bottle of enduro lights and what i found with that is it keeps me cognitively really really clear so i can see things happening two hours into a race, I can make good decisions. And a lot of times if I'm starting to tire, the, the mental fatigue and the decision-making will go long before I physically crash. And so these are really great for, I just take two of those and then it buys me like another 40 minutes of mentally I'm as fresh as the beginning of the race. So I can see patterns, I can see other racers, I can see course decisions. And so I've been doing that for about four or five years now. And that's been this massive game changer in the second mm -hmm. half of races where I'm used to being a front runner leading out. And now I'm very happy to sit in fifth or 10th and just watch people make terrible choices. And you're like, <laughs> oh, wow, I used to do that. That's a terrible idea. Don't go south. <laughs> yeah, it's too. That's, ah, that's good. Okay, I'm just going to keep going this way. We'll be fine. <laughs> and so the, it's basically like an amino acid. And I've gotten into the pill and I've gotten into like powder form. And I'll just kind of put that in my water and stuff like that. And that's that's been like a really helpful long distance thing for me to just, it even helps me remember that, Hey, you should probably eat. Like sometimes we get late in a race. We just forget that we have food and we're getting hungry. Yeah. Well, obviously the advantage in, in road races is they have aid stations. They don't have aid stations. No. <laughs> you just pack it all in like a camel, you get pockets everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And like that's one thing little... too, right? It's hard to like, well, Danny doesn't have that problem too much, but for a lot of people are they're just hanging on by like the tooth the thread of the train that they're in and literally i've lost a draft train by going like this yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's it right. so you but you fell have, behind the sweet wave <laughs> yeah i'm like oh gosh i mean so i think but i do think that paddling from what i've seen when people bonk and stuff in the bigger races with the bigger names nutrition is so underplayed and I know we've talked about it a lot. It's just like, I feel like there's so much more potential in this sport with how people are putting nutrients and hydration in their body that we don't realize yet because nobody's really doing it because it's kind of more of an inconvenience than when you're on a bike or you're running and somebody hands you a cup. So just being able to find the different things free before you feel like you're bonking uh, to be able to get it in. I saw this uh, and this guy was wearing a, a, a hydration patch this weekend. I've never actually... 
uh, done any research on that, but he said it helps him a lot. I got to look into it because that would be kind of cool for, mm. for paddling. I don't know. First time I saw it. It's got it. I saw something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Like, how does that work? <laughs> yeah. Sodium? How like does that work? How does it get through your skin? I didn't even look it up yet. I have no clue. <laughs> That's <laughs> really bizarre. Um, do you, uh, in, we've all talked about this myself with Victoria and Tony, um, because paddling it's an endurance sport, unlike running, where your body weight is at least supported. I mean, it's supported in a boat or supported on a board. Um, the use of creatine monohydrate or beta alanine, um, th is that something that you've used in the past to help with your paddling? No. I've, my wife's super into nutrition and kind of dials everything in for me, so I don't really do any supplements or anything. Um, Long, long time ago, I heard a couple of things that were really interesting. I was swimming and doing a bunch and kayaking. And it was, you know, your body, if you're paying attention, your body will crave things that it needs. And so that's always been something I kind of paid attention to. Like, you know, sometimes you're like, man, I just really need a steak right now. I have no idea why. I just go with that. Okay. And then the other one is uh, practice what you're going to eat before big events. So I kind of have a steady diet routine. My wife loves the whole nutrition thing. So since we started dating, you know, like 15 years ago, I've been on this really nice diet of she cooks at home. Everything's clean. Everything's very high, high nutrients. And then I'll, when she goes to work, I'll go slip in a cheeseburger just to make sure I can still process. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, this is the thing. Your body's gonna, your body's gonna want what it needs, and so I, I can kind of feel it in, in a normal training week of like, hey, I'm, I'm getting run down. I'm craving certain foods. Okay, you just kind of move that direction. And then the other one is, you know, you don't want to be so clean that you can't process something that you're not used to yeah. eating. And so, like what? when we travel and stuff, you get some weird foods, and right. so you start trying to find those places. Remember, like, oh wow, Subway. If you can find a Subway wherever you're at, you can have something you've had before. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> are you, uh, uh, Dan, are you familiar with the concept of periodization? Yes. Do you, is that something you, well, let me backtrack a little. Um, my wife is a competitive cyclist and she wins most of her races. In fact, she almost wins every race. So she's, she's high level. She's a <laughs> master's athlete and, um, she doesn't periodize all her training is, I would al almost say she, every training session is hard. For some reason, she recovers. I'd say more than half her training is high intensity interval training. Um, and I'm starting to think, and I want your comment on this, that in the endurance sports, periodization is overblown. The benefits of it are overblown and exaggerated only because I've watched so many endurance athletes who don't do it. They basically just train hard. I mean, they'll do long, easy days, but they train hard a lot and they just recover. And I think that's the difference. There's some people who just recover. I'm not yeah. one of them. <laughs> I'm sure Tony, you work with athletes. It's like, holy shit, he just recovers and recover quick. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, what are but your Carla, thoughts on periodization? Carla eats a lot of protein too, though. She eats three grams per kilo. She See, eats... like that might be why. Well, like, like, wait, Carla eats three grams per kilo. Three grams per kilo. She's like Danny. How much protein do you eat a day? Wow, I have no idea. I, it's probably, it's probably I not do like know, I do know I'll eat like a 600 calorie burrito as a snack if I'm hungry in between meals. <laughs> <That works. laughs> like like my, my wife grabs like a little piece of cheese and like a water and I'm just like, let's just heat up this Trader Joe's burrito and that, that'll hold me over for an hour until dinner. Yeah. But um, as far as uh, periodization and stuff is that I got two thoughts on that one is one, I think you're right for some of the if you've done the work before then you don't do that you don't really need or get this big benefit out of periodization of starting with a with a moderate volume and then slowly increasing it over a couple of weeks and then taking a break because you've done that before you've, you've gotten the volume i think that's really important for anyone who's new to a sport is to build themselves into what, what we would consider a normal training week of hard, some intervals, lots and lots of distance of paddling. But in in what we do with paddling, I found people, we talked about it earlier, sometimes they exercise paddle. They don't actually train paddling. They just exercise the proper amount. 
um, and they're not learning to get any better. They're not learning to feel the water. They're not learning to move the boards or the canoes or whatever it is. They're just, you know, hey, look, I did I did the proper uh, heart rate for the proper amount of time. And then the other one is, as athletes get older, I don't think there's this big peak spike anymore. Like you can't rest, recover, and then get these big ups and downs. What I found is with just the massive increase of things that are on my plate as far as being a dad, owning a business, having to train is you're not going to get these. I was 19 and I could do nothing for a week and then mm -hmm. slowly build and get this big spike of performance is I always joke, we call it uh, old man strength. And <laughs> it's somewhere, you know, between like, well, when you get old, you get strong. And I go, no, like the joke is when you see me, they're like, you never get tired. I go, here's the trick. When you're old, you wake up the most tired you could possibly be. Yeah. So it's all uphill from here. <laughs> <laughs> you're just always tired. Hey. There's always time. So you learn how to handle that. But I, I think, like you said, is uh, with periodization and increasing those workloads is if you've done it for a number of years or for a long time or your body's used to that, then you just kind of sort of do the right work at the right time before the events. And so I actually experienced that last year and had this amazing year uh, in the outrigger season where I was doing the same thing every week because that was only that was literally the only thing I had time for. Mm -hmm. I had a race every Saturday. I would try and paddle on Sunday if I wasn't too tired. Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, take Wednesday off, twice on Thursday, I'm out. Right. And every single week for five months. And it was hmm. one of the better years I've ever had. Well, so technically, there really is no time for a sustained periodization model because of the, the training frequency. Any, <laughs> I mean, the, the competition frequency is so high. Yeah, and a lot of people will want to do that. They'll go, well, I'll train through these races, and I'll peak on this one day way down the line three, four months from now. And I go, yeah, I'm going to race about 40-something times this year on seven versions of paddling. <laughs> so times. we're going to go ahead and just try and do the same thing over and over again. And I was stoked. I didn't have a race this weekend, but a couple weeks ago was a long one. And then in March, I had a bunch of weekends that were race on Saturday and a different race on Sunday. So you're kind of just doing the workload. And then for me, it's just listening to the body, recovering properly. And if you can recover, then you can go do work again. But a lot of people yeah, will just especially not like at, at your work. level, like Tony, Danny wins like a lot. So at his level, like at 40 races, there's probably like 30 of them that are like, want to win for sure. For sure. You know what I mean? Right, like, not, right. like a races, like there's probably like, like a five. <laughs> yeah. Whereas some people, they have like one race, they could focus on a year where they might be able to period periodize more. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's no sure. room for it in that because really it's like race, recover, race, recover. Exactly. Yeah. Recover yeah. <laughs> the, the racing itself is part of the training protocol. I mean, because you're yep. pushing so high and, and so you, with the proper recovery, you, you'd get the benefit from that racing intensity if you recover suitably. Yeah. Absolutely. And over here in California, we have eight local races where, the morning is like a four to six mile short course. So I'll race stand up in that. And then about 45 minutes later is a 10 to 12 mile OC1 course. So I'll turn around and jump into that. And wow. so that's my race day eight times is double races. Well, <laughs> that's uh, just you <laughs> doing that. There are people who can't recover from that. So you. Oh, no, it, it hurts. It hurts a lot. <laughs> and it, the last couple of years have been a little different because like people are showing up now. Normally it's like, that's my local race. It's just <laughs> me and my boys and we all double race. And then suddenly like a guy from Tahiti flies in and he's only doing the afternoon. And he's like, <laughs> I'm the defending world champion, but he was the last one. I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> it's like, this is not going to end well. Nobody told me I had to peak in January. <laughs> That's insane. Um, we're we're a little bit. Uh, we don't have much time left, Victoria. I don't know if you have any other questions for Danny, um, okay. Tony. I know this is a weird sport for you. You live in South Florida. You need to get on a board eventually. I, I will. No, no. I, just I'm going to do. Vote. I'm going to get on a board with with um, both of you. Uh, just know this: if I do drop in the ocean, it take me about eleven seconds to hit the bottom of Mariana's trench. Okay, oh, and that's only thirty six thousand feet. I know Danny knows how deep that is. Actually, you know, Victoria, I think Tony would be good on the OC. That's what I just said. Yeah, we'll uh, put him on the boat. We don't yeah, have to worry about him. He could pull. I'm not sure how long he could pull, but he could pull. I think you'd be surprised for a white fiber guy. My endurance pretty good. <laughs> nice.
Hey, Danny, uh, before before I let you go, I wanted to ask you, do you still hold the record for the 200 meter sprint? Um, I don't know. I, I was told it was broken in 20, 2022, maybe, but it was, I, I don't know. Our, the, we did one on a laser course in Germany in 2014. Um, flat water lake, and then it was broken on uh, two buoys set up going downwind in China. Oh, that doesn't. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. different. Yeah. 200 meters. I, I yeah. was like, man, that's awesome. This guy's so fast. He's like, wait, all eight people in the final broke the record. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with the wind, and that's why you know we we always are trying to figure out how to study SUP because it it we wish it could be studied. We have all the tools, right, Joey? I mean, we even yeah. have the VO two max boop. Yeah. You can't because of just the conditions. It's never controlled. So right. it just it just sucks. Right. right. And also, obviously, the skill component is so important that someone like you could win a short sprint, 200 meters, but also win a longer race, which you don't see that in track and field. That's right. Yeah. You, you've seen it once in, in speed skating. That was Eric Hyden in 1976 Hyden, yeah. or 1980. I forget which games. So you don't see it anywhere except stand up paddling. And, and it's really odd that someone who wins a sprint would win a distance event. And there's, it's gotta be a lot of it is just skill, right? Danny? A lot of it is skill. I mean, if you look at some of the best swimmers, uh, that is what I would equate stand up to on like a higher, um, more, more invested into the study, into the technique, because right now most of us are teaching ourselves how to paddle. And there are very few of us that, for, for me, I grew up paddling. So when they're like, hey, can you stand up and paddle? I was like, of course. We used to do that all the time for fun mm -hmm. as little kids. <laughs> and so we're, we're kind of slowly evolving it. The sport is still pretty new. And so we're growing that into it. But in theory, you know, you, you see like Katie Ledecky will go and smash all the records in distance. And then she shows up to the 200 and she's still highly competitive. And right. So it's amazing. At, at a certain point, there's, there's a skill level. What I found in most paddling sports is there's – there's a minimum skill level, and then we can talk about whether or not your fitness, your strength, and all these you know physical attributes you have are better than somebody else who has at least that skill. But right now, there's so much, so much to be had in the skill and the feel for the water that you you can make up for a lot of physical deficits just by being efficient, is what they call it, or essentially, mm -hmm. I just call it not drowning. <laughs> well, that's uh, Victoria. That's Rory. He's very skilled, even though he doesn't train. Yeah, he's annoying. <laughs> he hasn't yeah. paddled in years, and if he goes and paddles with me for a, like a mile, just a short <laughs> mile, he'll still beat me. <laughs> he Just—it's like you, the Hawaiians. They got that thing, you know. He he puts his finger in the water, catches a fish, you know. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> um, well, Danny, we're out of time. It's been great having you as a guest. Um, learned a lot about training for paddling yeah. and I'm sure we have a million and one questions and hopefully you can make it to the, you know, to the East coast, South Florida, you know, we've got a great paddling here. So, yeah, um, and we don't have that ice water you have over there, Danny, that you're paddling in all the time. <laughs> it's, it's been a little chilly this winter, a little more than most. So. <laughs> Victoria, have any final thoughts for Danny? No, thanks for coming on. Yeah. It's fun and <laughs> yeah, interesting. Come to, come to Florida. We'll get extra room here for you. Amen. Definitely. Definitely. Thanks for having me, you guys. It was awesome. Hey, thanks, Enjoy Danny. It. Appreciate it. Thanks, Danny. Thanks.